Good morning. Happy Boxing Day. Welcome back to Breakfast on GB News with Cameron Walker and Pip Thompson. Now, Cameron. Yes. We know that you are a royal correspondent here on GB News and something that, well, I don't know about you, but I love to do a quiz over Christmas and there's loads of quizzes in the papers today. And this one is a memory game for 2023 and it's split oh, into dear. different topics and there's a royals topic. Let's so see if I'm still royal correspondent by the end of exactly. the show. Exactly, okay. Yeah. <laughs> King Charles and Queen Camilla's two dogs, Beth and Bluebell, are what breed? Jack Russell's. Correct. Yay! What okay. nickname does Mike Tyndall have for Prince William because of the future king's low alcohol tolerance? Oh, one pint Willie or something yes. like that? Yeah, OK. Oh, good. Well Goodness. done. And finally, which actress plays Kate Middleton in season six of The Crown oh. in which she meets William? Do you know, I, I don't know her name, I'm afraid. She looks very much like Kate Middleton did in the early 2000s, but I have no idea what her name is, I'm afraid. Meg Bellamy. OK, I think two out of the three is OK. That's Because right. two are royal questions, and one, I would argue, is actually showbiz, so it doesn't matter that I got it wrong. There's still eight left, so we'll come oh, back okay. to it. OK, <laughs> great. We've got the whole show to do the <laughs> royal Christmas quiz. Good. Still. Let's take a look at some <laughs> of the newspaper front pages. Yeah, the Daily Mirror leads with King Charles being nicknamed the King of Peace after he calls for tolerance and respect between faith as thousands die in wars. The Guardian leads with an exclusive report that says children are at risk of diabetes, heart disease and other serious health problems after ministers shelve anti-obesity policies until 2025. The Daily Telegraph leads with the NHS being under fire after analysis shows menopausal women are three times more likely to be offered hormone treatments than others. The Daily Express leads with top Tories insisting that interest rates must be slashed to give the economy a vital kickstart early next year. The I are leading with the Tories facing a new threat for the next general election from, from Nigel Farage's party, Reform UK, as they continue to close the gap on the Conservatives. Well, joining us to go through some of the day's headlines is broadcaster Albie Amoncona. Great to see you. And broadcaster Andrew Eborn. Good, good morning, morning, Andrew. Nice to see Happy you Happy Boxing Day to you both. What should we start with, Albie? You, you, uh, you take us through the first story. Let's start with the King's speech, shall we? Because I think it was quite an important speech from the King yesterday. Really, I thought, hammered home the multi-faith society that we live in in the United Kingdom. He made lots of references to all faiths. He made a reference to the Abrahamic family of religions, that, of course, being Judaism, Islam and Christianity. He also spoke about people with no faith. And I think that's particularly poignant at this time of year, because, of course, we do see a lot of a war going on, of course, in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas. And that is really a pseudo-religious war between a Jewish state and um, an Islamic group. What so do you mean when you say to... pseudo-religious war? Well, it is really a war between two different religions in the Middle East, between Israel and Hamas. You have the Muslim-led Hamas organisation, which people call a terrorist group, and of course the world's only Jewish state, Israel. So a lot of people call that not just a pseudo-religious war, but a religious war. And he was making the point yesterday that we are from an Abrahamic family of religions, that actually these religions that all come from a similar part of the world share lots of common features. And it was still very much grounded in a Christian message, though. He kept referring to the Christmas story uh, and the nativity, but also helping others, didn't he? Yes, he did. He spoke about the armed forces and people working throughout Christmas, like many broadcasters were, of course. But he was speaking about the forces and how they were involved in the coronation and really making a reference to all of the services that people provide each other just out of the goodness of our hearts. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. We'll come, we will come back to uh, the King's speech. I'll well, be one, interesting to see what the ratings missing, were for it. The one thing that was missing, which I always love with the Queen, she used to have the photos of the family. Do you remember Yeah, that? I yes. noticed that. And, you, you yeah. had the, and um, Harry was obviously not there. You had Fergie back in the fold, which I thought was glorious. Although I have to say that the male's picture of her uh, was probably not the most flattering. Fergie falling over is not really the best look, is it, for that particular side? Uh, but it, it was missing, those family photos. It felt yeah. quite... It felt quite, and I know people will disagree with me, but it felt quite businesslike for yes. King Charles. Whereas I think when the Queen did her message, there was, like you say, because of the family there photos, warm, and she was normally there. seated. It there was it was more sort of a, 
comforting, if you like. Yeah, I mean, it was a different style. It was it was filmed in a room which we don't see very often, the yes. centre room of Buckingham Palace, which opens out into the and iconic balcony. It hadn't been done from Buckingham Palace for a few years, had it? No, it hadn't, because it was COVID and Queen Elizabeth was in Windsor Castle. And then, of course, the king wanted to pay tribute to his mother for his first Christmas message. But I think what was striking, OK, it didn't have family photographs, but it did have a real-life tree for yes. the first time. Um, as you can probably expect with King Charles, uh, eco-friendly um, ornaments as well. No, absolutely, and, and all credit to him on, on that sort of basis. And as he said, he wants to be the king of all faiths, even though head of the uh, head of the Christian church, and that sort of side, quoting from the Bible, do unto others, you have done none to yourself. I think all that is a really, really good positive message. Uh, but yes, there's an interesting fact. Actually, I did think he missed the trick, and I think any father missing out on one son at Christmas um, mm. is probably a sad... The thing it? is, it might have been a bit distracting because oh, people would have been say. looking at the telly yeah. thinking, is Harry there? <laughs> is Meghan there? Put him there. Is Archie that, that there? That was a golden opportunity to put everybody there. But if, even if he did put Harry and Meghan there or didn't, and some family members were there and some weren't, it would, as you say, Pip, mm. perhaps distract from the, the message of his, of his Christmas speech. Like, okay. Overshadowing. Andrew, what, what have you found? Well, talking of interesting fragmented uh, parties and, and, and relationships, uh, the Tories, this is in the eye, the Tories facing a new general election threat from uh, R. Nige's party, uh, working on that sort of basis. So what's happening? They failed to close the gap, that's what they're saying about the Conservatives, uh, who are fighting on two fronts with the rise of Reform UK. And Reform UK, they've basically risen 9% in the polls, 9% uh, uh, over the very uh, start of the year, uh, where they sort of started on 6%. And this is an increased challenge. And I was talking to a number of people. I mean, Richard Tice is obviously dances on this channel now, and, uh, and, and David Bull, who I, I know very well as well, yes. who's the deputy leader. And they are saying that we're not going to give up the votes, is what happened. They've all received a letter turning around and saying, no, a vote for a reform is a vote for a reform. But I do think they're going to possibly be the kingmakers on mm. that sort of side. With those sort of percentages, it is a very interesting thing. But our general election is a first past the post system. Yes. So are they going to be able to get that number of votes over the line. Yeah, I, I think this is the point they're sort of emphasising. They always say, look, it's not a wasted vote, because that's the standard narrative. They always say history repeats itself, because people don't learn the lessons from history. So you can predict what's going to happen with the narrative. They're going to say, oh, don't vote for them, because it's a vote for there. You work on that sort of principle. The other thing we're going to see is a lot of the first election ever uh, that we have AI front and centre. And, you know, my passion is about artificial intelligence and all these deep fake videos and so on and so forth. There's going to be loads and loads of those well, Andrew, next year. A vote for reform, let's be very clear, because the first past the post system is a vote for Labour. Anyone voting for reform is making it more likely that Labour will win the next general election. And we do just have to be honest about that. Of course, the Reform Party are going to say, oh, well, if we all just vote reform, reform will win the general election. But that's not going to happen. It will cause a Labour win. And we don't know how involved yet. Nigel Farage might be. Yes, of course, and I'm sure if uh, Nigel Farage does get back to the back to frontline politics for the Reform Party, that's going to make them a lot stronger. But ultimately, we live in a two-party country, mm. and first past the post makes it very difficult for third parties to actually get in power. What do I you mean, think it, will turn them around? Because that's the interesting. We always talk about the silver bullet, where you're having this 80-seat majority not so many years ago, and they all say a week in politics is a long time. Mm. Within the next year, either in March or possibly October, they're going to do it. Not in November because of the uh, U.S. election. What is going to be the silver the bullies. We talk about taxes, we talk about immigration, we talk about the other bits and pieces, the five pledges. What will turn people around? I think it really depends. You've got lots of people, and especially the government, making a lot of noise over this Stop the Boats policy. And I personally think the Stop the Boats pledge from Rishi Sunak was looking like a mistake if we actually look back. I think at the, li the, the Liaison Committee last week, he actually refused to put a date on when he was going to be able to stop the boat. So it seems like an impossible task. But the Tories have really wedded themselves to this to this. Oh, goal. and also the boats are a fraction of the problem when it comes to immigration. And I do wonder whether on the doorstep people will say they're more concerned about the cost of living, how much money they've got in their pocket each month. That's a, that's a huge thing when we think about, you know, what's been happening with inflation, what's yeah. been happening with interest rates. You're absolutely right. And what's interesting, people will think, oh, what is the one issue? It's not one issue. They're all interrelated. It's absolutely cost of living. It's the cost of what's going to happen on inheritance or the tax and so on mm. and so forth. But immigrate, they're all interrelated. Obviously, immigration has a knock-on effect for services which are here, but also the provision of those services, not just the cost. OK. Albie, let's have a look at this Guardian exclusive. Children in England at risk of diabetes, heart disease and other serious health problems because ministers have shelved anti-obesity um, 
uh, measures. measures. Yes. yes. Yeah. So in 2020, the government commissioned a report, I believe, by Henry Dimbleby. Uh, so they were called the Dimbleby reforms, and he, he came up with this whole plan of how we were going to tackle childhood obesity, including things like banning online advertising, banning buy one get one free, buy one get one free deals on junk food, having uh, junk food advertisements happen after 9 p.m., for example, and a whole host of other measures. But because of pressure from parts of the Conservative Party, people saying that this was too much of a nanny state, the government has kicked these plans into the long grass. But actually, the facts don't change just because you kick mm. the policies down the road. We're expecting that two in five children in England are going to be overweight by the time that they leave school. Um, and there's a very, some very interesting reporting on these topics. I always find quite quite frustrating, actually, this whole idea that, that it's only wealthy families who are able to sidestep retail environments and make good decisions. You know, it's not only wealthy people that can make good decisions about food. Anyone can decide to pick an apple over a packet of crisps, but they've just got to be given the information, the education to make better health, healthy decisions. But, Andrew, do you, do you think there is, though, a link between um, obesity and families in, in oh, more deprived w without, areas. Yeah, w without uh, doubt. And I think that's the reality. Some of these healthy foods are really quite expensive. And this is the problem. You go for a, your happy, miserable meal, whatever you want to try and do. Yeah. It, it's much cheaper to get that. And it's also easy for families. Mm. What we need to look at is the economics of the whole thing. As I say, it's all interrelated. So eating healthily should be good. The other thing, I'm a, uh, a trustee of a, a charity, which, uh, which the Queen is a patron of, called UK Harvest, which is all about educating people about food and about waste and so on and mm. so forth, and excess food, and how you can do really useful things to make sure that people can actually afford decent meals. How easy is it, though, to have all this healthy food, fruit, vegetables, yes. um, a lot cheaper than perhaps junk food? Is it about education or is it about fundamentally changing the way that food distribution happens in this country? I, I think the answer is both. Like, like all these things, it's that sort of education. Start with the education. Say to people, let's do that big campaign. Eating an apple is, is, is great. And actually, it is very reasonable. You work on that sort of basis. And you look at the stats and uh, how that's going to have a knock-on effect for people. I mean, in the days when I was growing up, I school they used to give you a little bit of milk which you had with your, your bits and pieces to make sure you you got your calcium and things <laughs> but, like I mean that. supermarkets have a lot of responsibility with this as well when you look at the shelves and often there's you know I don't know if you've got your Tesco club card you've got a reduced price on massive family bag of crisps mm. You know, that's surely part of it, too. Well, of course, I mean, th this is what the Dimbleby, Dimbleby reforms were all about. He wanted to ban those buy one, get one mm. free deals that you were just referencing to with the deals on packets of crisps. But I do also think there's a lot of dancing around this issue. We, we like to say it's about education. We like to say it's about buy one, get one free deals. We don't like to say to people, actually, you're making bad decisions. And I was looking up, just to do some research before, a bag of apples is not more expensive than a family packet of crisps. And ultimately, these are individuals making individual decisions and we can't just say you can have all the education in the world you can have all the bands in the world ultimately you and I decide what we eat and sometimes you've just got to say make a better decision it's a vicious circle though isn't it because you get all this obesity then that has a knock-on effect effects with the NHS as well. No, no, absolutely, and I think that's why prevention is much better than cure. You work out why are there these pressures on the NHS. It's because we're eating not in a very healthy way. That's a really good start to look at that sort of science. So you're absolutely right. But again, it does go back to education, and part of the education is saying, well, a big bag of apples is cheaper than your uh, Happy Meal or other, other things that are available. Um, work on that sort of principle. So I think make availability, make it cost-effective, but make sure that people understand the importance OK, thank you for the moment, gentlemen. We will come back uh, to you very shortly. Very good morning to you and happy Boxing Day. I know it's winding a few of you up, but there's plenty of other people who are with me on this and are saying there's nothing wrong with Happy Boxing Day. Pip's not going to let this go, I'm afraid. No, I'm not. <laughs> I've got a bee in my bonnet about this. Uh, but Steve in Hearn Bay in Kent, you agree with me. Uh, who else have we got? Judy We've in got... Aberdeenshire as well. I believe it agrees with you. John in Dover says, I've been saying Happy, Bo Happy New Boxing Day for about 35 years. Why is it New Boxing Day? <laughs> Let us know, John. Bob, <laughs> Bob says... Boxing Day is the second day of Christmas Tide, the 12 days of Christmas, so you're quite entitled to say Happy Boxing Day. Keep the happiness and joy going. Rick's doesn't agree with you, though, I'm afraid, Pip. Oh, Rick's. Says, 
It is not a thing, and by saying it, it just sounds so ignorant. OK, I am ignorant. But plenty of people do agree with you, Pip, so it's fine. Uh, Kath says, I'm doing a crossword while watching you. One of the clues are something Boxing Day. The answer is, you guessed it, <laughs> happy. So it must be officially correct. I mean, if it's in a crossword, it must be correct. We'll, we'll, we'll ask, uh, we'll ask uh, Albie and Andrew in a minute what yeah. they reckon about this. Let's it's clearly, this debate. It's clearly, we're clearly getting a debate going. Yes. Um, but let's first of all just take a look at some of the newspaper front pages. And the Daily Mirror leads with King Charles being nicknamed the King of Peace after he calls for tolerance and respect between faiths as thousands die in wars. The Guardian leads with an exclusive report that says children are at risk of diabetes, heart disease and other serious health problems after ministers shelve anti-obesity policies until 2025. The Daily Telegraph leads with the NHS being under fire after analysis shows menopausal women are three times more likely to be offered hormone treatment than others. And the Daily Express leads with top Tories insisting that interest rates must be slashed to give the economy a vital kickstart early in the new year. The Times leads with Labour drawing up a legally watertight alternative to the Rwanda plan, so Sir Keir Starmer is no longer seen as having a weak stance on immigration. The I are leading with the Tories facing a new threat for the next general election from Nigel Farage's party, Reform UK, as they continue to close the gap on the Conservatives. Well, joining us to go through some of the day's headlines is broadcaster Albie Amancona and broadcaster Andrew Eborn. Happy Boxing Day to you both. <laughs> happy, happy Boxing, boxing day. day. We love it. It's got to be good. But do you know why it's called Boxing Day, which will tell you why it is happy? Do you know why it's called Boxing Day? Tell us. I will tell you, because it's a fact or fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be that they used to give boxes to the poor to help them out, which obviously made them happy. It's spreading the good cheer after Christmas time. So you are absolutely right. Happy Boxing Day is the right way to to do it. It's boxes to the poor, and that's what happened. But from boxes to foxes is what we should look at, because well, I want to boxes. see what I did there. Um, <laughs> Very and, good segue. And what I love, I mean, your, your debate, what I love about your show is you are brilliant at shedding more light and less heat on the topics. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a great debate, but I think we should look at what the law actually says at the moment, because they're saying that Keir, uh, basically, there's this hunt feud, they're warning about this sort of, if you upset the people who are supporting this sort of sudden hunting. But fox hunting is illegal in England, Scotland and Wales. It's still legal in Northern Ireland and what they're saying is basically under the Hunting Act 2004 but there's this thing called the trail hunting is what they're doing and basically they've got a particular scent and people talk about loopholes I think we should dig a bit deeper as to what those loopholes are mm -hmm. uh, especially on the PC breakfast show the Pip and Cameron see what I did there yes um, if you work on that basis so what they're saying is that if these trails sometimes the hounds go off track and it's such an emotive topic and, and you're right and seeing foxes being pulled apart you're absolutely right it's all Awful on that sort of basis. What we need to look at, though, is what are those loopholes and do they really need cl uh, closing? Mm. Because the reality is, is that it is already banned. That's what we need to say to people. When they're doing this trail things, which is an essential part for some people of the traditions of England and Wales and various mm. other places as well. It's an essential part of the countryside. And to turn it into a political side, where Keir has said, oh, we're going to ban all hunting, including trail hunting, uh, they're very worried about that being uh, losing lots of votes as a, as a result. But part, part of this debate, isn't it, uh, about the legality of it is to do with um, intent. Yes. And if the hounds go too far ahead and you can't call them back, then yeah. you didn't intend for that fox to die. It was just the hounds were too far yes. ahead for you to do anything about it. And it's it. the same thing, as you know, a barrister. So it's a, you, you have a, a criminal intent, you have two things. One's mens rea, a guilty mind, and the actus rea, which is the act of being guilty about it. What they're saying when they do these trails, they're saying it's the same scent as the animal, and therefore they're chasing the fox. So we need to look at the mm. specifics and work out what are those loopholes, if they are loopholes, and yes. how do we close them if Andrew, necessary. Andrew, you mentioned Keir's worried about losing votes over fox hunting. How many votes do you think are in fox hunting? I've got to be honest, mm. I don't particularly care about fox hunting. I'm sure it's not very nice for the foxes, but ultimately this is something that a very small part of the population do, tends to be more the upper classes. I know it is an important issue in the countryside, but there are many people that might be watching the show who actually just think, well, we banned it back in whenever it was, and now let's just move on to something else. I think you're right. It, it is controversial, but whether it's on the top five yes. list of it's what people actually care, pledging, care no. about not when it comes to voting... <laughs> no. <laughs> Although it might be easier, of course. I mean, will, will this be something that Tories could use to try and get votes from these grassroots um, people in the countryside?
I just get the sense that we've moved on from fox hunting debates. It almost feels like a little bit of an odd debate to be talking about in 2023. It's not something that I've grown up thinking about in my life. I know this was a big issue at the time that Tony Blair was elected. It almost feels like a bit of deja vu. Are we back in 1997? We're having another conversation about fox hunting the year before Labour are elected, potentially. Well, it's okay. interesting. Lord Mandelson, this is reported in the article as well, he, he admitted that Tony Blair's a fox, banking, uh, a fox hunting ban was one of the policies he most regrets. I mean, that's an extraordinary thing to admit. And mm. you look on that sort of basis, but I think we need to change the language of it. If this is not fox hunting. Fox hunting is banned. It's trail hunting. And does that lead to a loophole? OK. Andrew, thank you very much. Welcome back. Let's take a look at some of the newspaper front pages for you. The Mirror leads with the King uh, being nicknamed King of Peace after he calls for tolerance and respect between faiths as thousands die in wars. The Guardian leads with an exclusive report that says children are at risk of diabetes, heart disease and other serious health problems after ministers shelve anti-obesity policies until 2025. The Daily Telegraph leads with the NHS being under fire after analysis shows menopausal women are three times more likely to be offered hormone treatment than others. The Daily Express leads with top Tories insisting that interest rates must be slashed to give the economy a vital kickstart early next year. The Times leads with Labour drawing up a legally watertight alternative to the Rwanda plan, so Sir Keir Starmer is no longer seen as having a weak stance on immigration. The I are leading with the Tories facing a new threat for the next general election from Nigel Farage's party, Reform UK, as they continue to close the gap on the Conservatives. We're well, joining us now to go through some of the day's headlines is broadcaster Albi Abnakona and broadcaster Andrew Eborn. Welcome to you both again. Thank you very much. Um, Lovely story, first of all, Andrew. Um, a blind schoolgirl with a brain tumour having a bit of a surprise is from it, the Queen. Isn't that absolutely glorious? Olivia Taylor was her name, and she's had a troubled childhood. She's had a lot of chemotherapy and so on and so forth. And she was invited to, for tea uh, with, with the Queen, and um, she said, uh, uh, her first taste of tea, I love tea, to which the Queen replied, oh, you love tea, there you are. You'll be able to have tea from now on. What I also loved, it was in the very room that that glorious Paddington sketch took place. So she was in there and everything Aww. else, and she brought her own little bear along, which I think was called Corrie, after the coronation, and Corrie has been with her. There she is. Corrie has been with her at every time she's ever had a procedure. So uh, the Queen is wonderful at uh, touching the hearts and souls of all sorts of people, uh, and she was particularly good on this one. So it's lovely to have a good story on Boxing mm. Day, and what a happy Boxing Day it's made it. Absolutely, and a very festive red colour she's wearing as yeah. well. <laughs> um, Albie, we've been talking about what, what we've been doing on Boxing Day, Christmas Day. Um, people like me did nothing but eat and drink. But other people wouldn't, went nuts and went for a very cold swim. They did, and they do it all across the country. On the front page of The Guardian this morning, we've got some, some pictures of people taking part in the Christmas Day swim at St Agnes in Cornwall. But these Christmas Day open water swims happen all over the country. They happen at beaches down on the south coast. They happen in London over at the Serpentine. Is it something you've ever wanted to do, Cam? It, it looks very, very <laughs> cold. I mean, I must admit, I'll go swimming in British waters in the summer, Winter, not so sure. I was in Brighton for Christmas last year and it definitely didn't take my fancy at all. But they're not wearing wetsuits. They're all wearing just swim yeah, shorts. I've done it, actually. I've done it in early December and I did it for um, a live broadcast. And, and it was it was quite funny because I went in there totally forgetting <laughs> that I had all my mic on. Oh, no. oh, 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 so I could, I could hear the, the studio <laughs> gallery. And, of course, they were all shouting at me because I was doing the breaststroke. Right. And it was... I'll tell you what it is. It is mind over matter and yes. it's about breathing. Yeah. 
Breathe, breathe, breathe. Yeah. And it's very good for you. I mean, the cold therapy is what, what yeah. you do in Sweden after you're sore, you roll in the snow and get beaten with birch twigs and things like that. Um, but we used to do it. Brackish and Bay, I was on the south coast, along yeah. from Brighton. Mm. And it always used to be the New Year's Eve thing. You would rush into the sea, which is mm. glorious. But it's a really weird one because this was one of the hottest Christmases of all. Um, but what I, what I found extraordinary, I was looking at the, the meteorological website in terms of how they define a white Christmas now because it's changed. And what they've said is that if a single flake of snow falls anywhere in the UK between that 24-hour period from the 24th of December, that will count as a white Christmas, yeah. which I think is cheating a bit. Even it? if well, it is very warm. And it happened in the Scottish Highlands. Now, Andrew, unwanted Christmas gifts. Yes. You know, as grateful as we are, there's always some of us who decide to sell things on. We say just a few of us, but actually it's a huge percentage. They say a third of young people will sell on their presents. A third. How ungrateful is that? Why just young people? Well, I don't know, I, because I think the old people just don't confess to doing it. I, I think, <laughs> but they're saying it's the online uh, auction sites and so on and so forth. And they're saying it's about, the, the survey was for 18 to 34 year olds, nearly three in 10, 29 percent, plan to sell their unwanted gifts, which is it sort of begs the question about why would you do that? And this whole thing about Christmas and forcing people to have fun and forcing them to exchange gifts and so on and so forth, which they don't really want to do, I think we need to have a bit more honesty about it so and it works on that sort of principle. Albie, you, you're younger. Yes, do you, I'm, do you, I'm do you age your unwanted. I don't Christmas normally gifts. resell them. What I tend to do if I get a Christmas gift I don't like is I will gift it to someone else. You know, it's quite often that thing you have a dinner party, someone brings over a bad bottle of wine, you just give it to the next person when you go to <laughs> a dinner party at their house. And I think in this story as well, uh, Andrew talks about one third of young people. It's actually one, one in six people in general actually list their unwanted Christmas gifts on websites. So it's something we all do, and I think it's a good way to counter waste. That is, that is yeah. very true. Could give that it to a charity shop true. as well. Yeah. It's always another alternative.